It was precisely at this hour, 30 years ago tonight, that Buzz Aldrin became the second man in history to step onto the lunar surface. And he joins us here in our Washington bureau, as does Andrew Chaikin, who's written about space exploration and astronomy for nearly 20 years, including an essay in the new book, Full Moon, a collection of NASA lunar photos. And I hope you'll forgive me, Andrew, if I spend the first couple of minutes talking to Buzz Aldrin. This is a great thrill. Uh, especially to have you here tonight. And I wonder, as you were looking at some of that video, are you just watching historic video now, or does it bring it back for you? Well, I've seen it many, many times. Each time is a little bit different when I uh, notice something, concentrate on something, but uh, it's nice to see, and it's nice to realize on these anniversaries that we were so fortunate to have been a part of that wonderful experience. As you talk about fortunate and you talk about luck, we have been reading a great deal and hearing a great deal these last couple of weeks about that memorandum that Bill Sapphire drafted. You know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. The memorandum for the widows, your wife, Neil Armstrong's wife, in the event that getting back to the command ship didn't work. Talk about that from I mean, talk about it from the vantage point of right now. When you, I mean, you had had you ever seen that memo before or heard of it? I, I don't think I had, but but I, uh, we may have had some hints that something like that did exist. Uh, but I'm not surprised that something like that comes out uh, as we approach uh, an anniversary and somebody wants to do some research. Uh, I am surprised that we pay so much attention to it because any large organization that has a leader and, a, and an appropriate staff is going to have a staff that's going to prepare that leader for whatever eventualities may come about, oh, whether absolutely. they're successful or, or failures. Right. So the fact that someone, whether it's Frank or anyone else, uh, had someone uh, sort of brought about to, to, to pick someone case. like, like uh, Bill Sapphire to do that, right. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. And no, I think his words were very appropriate. The, I, it's just that we didn't care that much about uh, that particular issue. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to get to about. I, I agree with you. The memorandum, kind mm -hmm. of obvious that that would be written of certain historical interest right now. But I think what it brought to an awful lot of us, you clearly knew what the risks were. I'm not sure that the rest of us did. And so as you went, as you landed on the moon, when you and Neil Armstrong then were sort of cavorting around on the moon and when you got back into, into your lunar module, did you have any discussion at all about, I hope this works, I know it's going to work, uh, if, or, 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 or was it just unspoken? If we did, I'm sure it would have been in a joking fashion. If you have a concern about whether it's going to work, uh, it's too late to think about it then. You should have thought about it months before and asked, asked some questions of people. Did you? No. There was no way that anyone in the crew could assure themselves that everything, everything was going to work properly. We had to rely on people who were well qualified to put all of that together. You have to have that faith that these people are going to do the best job that they can, just like they had the faith that we were going to do the best job that we possibly could. And that's why we, I think, were so spring-loaded to the be alert position. Everybody, given that kind of an opportunity, wants to look good. We want to look good, too. Andrew, talk for a moment about what the, what the general awareness within NASA was of the dangers at that time. You know, you have a whole sort of series of concentric circles, you know. The Buzz and Neil were at the center because they were the ones who were going to risk their lives if that engine didn't light. They were going to be stranded on the moon with no hope of rescue. Then you have the people who sort of designed the engine and know the intricate workings of it. And then you have the managers in NASA up in Washington who many a time during Apollo were sitting in the back row of mission control, they used to call it the eagle's nest, wringing their hands or maybe not visibly or, or you know, clenching their jaws at the risks that their agency was taking for, for the good of, of the national prestige. When I and forgive me, Buzz, if I paraphrase your own thoughts for you, but when I interviewed Buzz, I asked him that question. I said, 
how do you deal with the fact that you are trusting your lives to that one engine? Do you think about what happens if you don't get off the moon? And he said, why would I, why would I think about that? Why would I stack the deck against success when so much had been done to ensure success? In other words, Yes, they took risks, but they were well-legislated risks. They were risks that had been thought out over a span of years. The engine that, that particular engine out of many engines in Apollo had been tested again and again and again, designed so that it was as simple as possible. Now, having said that, I have to tell you that when I interviewed Neil, I said, I've heard that you tried to get a system built into the engine so that you could manually actuate the valves because you know it didn't have an ignition system right. as long as the fuels got into the chamber it would fire but that they couldn't do it for you and he said yeah I, I did have some concern about the engine and I did propose a manual system and they couldn't come up with it in time so you see that it's not monolithic there are different feelings about it Buzz the competition with the mm -hmm. Soviet Union at that time how important was that? How much of a driving force was that? I think it drove the whole program. It's what really got it initiated, starting with uh, Sputnik, and uh, then their launches after that. That scared the hell out of us, didn't it? I mean, when they, when they launched Sputnik... It appeared to have done that. You know, I have to admit, I was a fighter pilot at the time, and I was in Europe, and we had some other concerns uh, about that time, and it frankly did not make a big impression on me that shows how close uh, I was not really to the space program yeah, but I think it's I think it scared it, it certainly did scared yes. the devil out of out of the administration at the and, time and, the and there was competition leading right on up to the commitment to go to the moon was it was it ever a factor of so much competition that perhaps they were pushing it a little too hard and too fast cutting corners I don't think so. You're hesitating. I find that interesting. Well, we, we moved at the most rapid pace we could. When we had the, uh, the fire, uh, we recovered from that relatively quickly in comparison to the recovery from the Challenger accident. Uh, a number of missions were eliminated that were block one missions that were going to be that same spacecraft that was involved in the fire. Uh, we jumped immediately to, to block two, and we just did just the bare minimum number of missions needed to qualify the command module and the l lunar module to land. And we, we had about two missions to spare. If, if we'd flown in uh, July and didn't make it, we had two more opportunities to try and make it to the moon before the end of 69. Let me broaden the, the discussion out a little bit, Andrew, and, and, and start with you. What was gained? by landing on the moon, beyond enormous prestige, great pride, a feeling that something mankind has always wanted to do has finally been ac accomplished. What was achieved? Right. Well, on the most basic level, we became a space-faring space species. We showed that we, you know, as, as Neil Armstrong said in that clip, we were no longer confined to just one planet. And that in itself is not just the achievement of one nation, it's an evolutionary milestone for the entire human species. Uh, in a more specific sense, we learned so much about the moon and about the solar system. The moon is our Rosetta Stone for understanding how the Earth and the solar system came to be. We got enormous technological uh, advantage out of it, microelectronics and computers, those were all spurred by Apollo. And I think, finally, we got a spiritual lift out of going to the moon. We had a mountaintop experience for the entire human race. When we look back, I say we because all of us saw the pictures and heard the voices coming to us. Well, here's the man who actually experienced I, the event. What, what would your answer I, I to the same question? I think there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, we have uh, the end of the Cold War now. In 1991, no one really expected that we're going to see the turn of the century uh, with the Soviet Union uh, in, the, in the position that they're in now. And I think it's because we made that commitment and we carried that through. And it made a distinct impression on the Soviets, maybe more so than anyone else, that we would do that. And then later on, when we might make another commitment to build a defense against 
the threatening aspect of intercontinental missiles. You're talking about the whole, the whole Star Wars program. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the potential of making another commitment of advancing our abilities in that direction, we, whatever you want to call it. They knew, Gorbachev knew that they couldn't win that race either, and he had to change direction. Now, a lot of people aren't going to agree with that, but the fact of the matter is we don't have that Cold War going on now. And I think that history eventually is going to say it's because we had the guts to make that kind of a commitment. And despite what was going on in Southeast Asia, and despite the fire, we carried through with that commitment. I need to ask you one more quick question. Try and give me a, a concise sure. answer. Have we lived up to the promise of that day 30 years ago? Well, we talked about competition a little bit ago. When you compete, you do something to get there in a hurry, and uh, without really realizing it, we built in the gradual demise of the Apollo program by not building into it a gradual buildup into sustainability. We threw everything away that was part of that rocket, and now we're still trying to bring the cost down of rocket launches. And the only way you're going to do that is through reusability. But that's a barrier now because we've got expendable rockets and nobody wants to uh, put those rockets out of business by having something that you don't have to keep building one after another. Andrew, I know you're twitching to get in, <laughs> but I'm afraid we're out of time. And so Andrew Chaik and Buzz Aldrin, uh, again, congratulations to you. It's a great thrill to have you here this evening, and thank you both very much. Thank you, Tim.